Daniel 12, 1. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. No other Old Testament book has such unique revelations concerning the end time and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. This television study will enlighten you on the book and the prophet Daniel. And now, with today's lesson, Dr. Lester Sumrall. The groupings of studies, you know, are very interesting, and we're delighted to have you in our, our great Bible class uh, studying uh, the book of Daniel. Uh, that's, this is the time to study Daniel, and it's very exciting, and we will be studying uh, Daniel and the Golden World Empire. Uh, maybe the big thing that you should write down is that this world is in its present time state is the only place where there will ever be judgment of nations as nations. All the judgments of the future will have to do with individuals and persons and not groups and not nations. And Babylon was founded by Nimrod, no doubt, the great grandson of Noah, about 2,000 years before Christ. In Genesis 10, 8 to 10, Cush begot Nimrod. He, be, he became a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, at the beginning of the kingdom was Babel. And the beginning of the kingdom was Babel, you see. Uh, Nimrod was a Hamite of the seed of Ham. His grandfather had been under a curse because of his sin in the time of Noah. And this, this Nebuchadnezzar, who became the greatest king of ancient times, uh, rebuilt and beautified what is called the city of Babylon. Today it's in rubble. Until it became the most magnificent city that the world has ever known at that time or at this time. Babylon was built in exact squares. It was 15 miles on each side or 60 miles if you went around the outside of those walls. Uh, it was protected by a brick wall 87 feet high a thick and 350 foot high. I want you to know that nothing going over the top of that. 700 feet wide at the base and 300 feet at the top. Such a formidable uh, piece of, a, of a protection. I don't suppose has ever been built by man before or since. On top of these walls were 250 towers, each tower uh, dedicated to a great hero who had fought and conquered for Babylon. And the top of the wall was, was wide enough for seven chariots to run abreast upon it. Around this wall, outside the city moat, a completely filled with water from the river Euphrates, and that it was a, a place that you couldn't get to at all. It, it had a drawbridge in front of the gates, and through the city ran one of the tributaries of the river Euphrates, giving it, in time of siege, giving it all the water that it needed. The great city of Babylon had 25 magnificent avenues, 150 foot wide, running north and south. It had 25 uh, uh, great avenues running east and west, making 676 great squares in that, in that fabulous city. Also, it had a wide avenue running in a circle on the inside of the walls and into all of the other avenues that were emptied into it. At the ends of the cross avenues were magnificent gates of, of bronze and brass that shone like a sun as they were being opened and closed. Babylon was divided into equal parts by the river Euphrates. It had ferry boats on each side of its main avenues, and at the central avenue, a great bridge spanned the river. Babylon had the tower that was named Bel after one of their gods, consisting of eight towers, 75 foot high, rising one above the other with an outside stairway with a chapel at the top, 660 foot high. See, when we told you that Babylon was great, we meant exactly what we said. This chapel had a golden image, 45 foot high, valued at nearly 20 millions of American dollars. That's gold dollars, not, not inflation money. The entire holy vessels of this temple are recognized to be worth something more than $200 million. Baal, the sun god. That's what Daniel was up against there. Uh, Babylon contained one of the seven wonders of the world called this hanging gardens. Uh, these gardens were 400 feet square. Uh, they were raised in terraces, one above the other in the height of 350 feet, and they reached by stairways 10 foot wide. And these terraces were planted with shrubbery and trees. 
It had the appearance of a forest-covered mountain, though Babylon was in the plain of the Euphrates. Mountains built by the seaside. These gardens were built by Nebuchadnezzar for a wife named Amitas, the daughter of the king of Media. Babylon had over one million people living inside of its walls. And there was a prophet in it in Isaiah 39 and 19, in Isaiah 13 and 19 that says, Behold, a Babylon, the glory of kingdoms and the, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency. <laughs> that was, <coughs> that's the place that this man Daniel had to go and to live. He was a young prince. He was a young student uh, when taken captive from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the king of Babylon. He was, uh, he was a tremendous uh, change being uh, dragged in uh, from his princely palace in Jerusalem to become a prisoner in a foreign land. And, and Daniel chapter 1 and verse 1, it, 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 it tells us, And the king spake unto the Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed, so he had to be royal, and of the princes, that's who he was, children in whom there was no blemish, well-favored, skillful in wisdom, cunning in knowledge, understanding science, such as had an ability to stand in the presence of a king, and whom might be, they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldees. And so that's, that's what Daniel was. <laughs> what tremendous qualifications. Amazing. So the first point is that he was now a young slave prince. The two don't go together very well. Uh, a young slave prince. You say, how do you know? In verse 6 of that same first chapter, it says, Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so he was there with three of his very close friends, all young princes in Israel. Daniel refused to eat the king's meat. Now here comes the first test of who he was and what was on the inside of him. In verse 8, it says, Daniel purposed in his heart... <laughs> <coughs> that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Now, this is what made him different. This rich food, too rich in order to be healthy, and had been offered to that ugly idol that I was telling you about, that ruled, they could see it for miles around, this great golden beast up at the top, the king of the sun, uh, that all the Babylonians had worshipped. Uh, and so uh, he... he uh, he didn't want to eat food that was offered to that beast. God gave him wisdom and knowledge along with the, four, the, the three children that were with him. In verse 17 of that same chapter, As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. Notice it says God did it. God did it. Daniel had an understanding in all visions and dreams. So he had supernatural. He had supernatural abilities. He had knowledge he did not learn. He had wisdom that he did not re receive from his teachers. It says that, that Jehovah gave him an understanding uh, of, uh, of uh, understanding of visions and in dreams. They discovered in that land of Babylon that had the brains of the world at that time in it, in Daniel chapter 1, verse 19, the king communed with all these young men from all over the world, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And so these young Israelis uh, that God had brought from their own land into the foreign land gave them favor with the king. And though they were slaves, they stood in the king's presence. You know, God can exalt you anytime he wants to, and you better believe that. God can exalt you. The Hebrew slaves dared to be different. <laughs> And verse 20, in all matters of wisdom and understanding, the king inquired of them. He found them ten times better than all the magicians, the astrologers that were in all his realm. And, and so these young men who dared to be different and not worshiping of idols, eating meat that had been dedicated to idols, uh, then they were different in that nobody in the land and even went into the magic uh, of the, of the uh, astrologers and of the, and, and of the magicians, none of them could compete with these young men. It says they happened to be ten times better. That would be a good place to make a little circle. They were ten times uh, better. But he was a man that could instruct others. And uh, 
we, we, we'll get to that in our, our next, in our, in our next lesson. It, it's very beautiful why, how he, he came to be able to counsel with kings and to give them information about what to do. And, and we, will, we will come into that uh, very strong. Uh, the, the, the king, the king and his coming empires were, were magnificently described uh, by this young man, beautifully, uh, beautifully told there. And uh, not only told them of all their empires, but of the empire to come, which we will certainly get into and go through uh, very, very, very carefully. And I'm sure that it will be a, a tremendous blessing uh, to you. In that, in, in that beautiful uh, chapter of Daniel, uh, in verse 9, it says, Now God brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. Now there was a man over them, and through the tender mercies of God Almighty, he brought him into a place of tender love and favor. I'd just like to say that if you will serve God, and if you will love God, and if you will be faithful uh, to God, he can bring you into tender love and great favor. And I believe it. And I, I, I want you to accept it that way. And I want you to believe it that way because it is absolutely, it is absolutely true that God can do that for you. And in verse 10, it says, And the prince of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who hath appointed me uh, your, your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort. They were princes. Then shall ye make my, me endanger my head to the king. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, sometimes you can get your best friends in trouble. And this man knew that. Now, now, he was in charge of training all the young princes that were to stand in the king's presence. Now, he said, I, I've got you four, and, and you're, you're different. Uh, you won't eat the meat of the king, nor drink his wine, and, uh, and, and now, what do you want me to do about it? It says, my head is at stake. My head will get cut off. When he looks and sees you four lean ones, and he sees those two or three hundred here fat ones, he's going to say, what happened to those four? What happened to them? And he says, I, I could die, because I'd have to say, well, I haven't fed them. And, and it would be terrible. And, and Daniel had to bring faith into the heart of a Babylonian, you know. Had to bring faith into it. He also had to bring courage into it so that he was saying, oh, wait a minute, I'm not going to lose my head. Uh, then uh, verse, verse 11 says, Then said Daniel to Melzar. Now, he, he was the one that he was dealing with. It says, He's the prince of the eunuchs that was set over Daniel and over Hananiah and Mishuel and Azariah. And then he said, Prove your servants. Now, you know, isn't that sweet of Daniel? He wasn't really a servant of that guy. Uh, but, uh, he, you know, he was willing to say that. He said, uh, prove your servants, you know, prove us. And called himself a servant. He says, I beseech you, you, you know, I beg of you. Now, now, just 10 days, and let me, and let them give us pulse to eat. Just, just plain pulse. A very common little food. That would be like bread today. Just pulse to eat. And water to drink. He said, prove it now. Well, now, the king was going to give them three years to get ready. They had three years of preparation before they could stand before him. The king thought it would be that long before they could learn anything worth, uh, you know, standing before his presence. And so he's going to be three years. And he said, well, sure, ten days won't hurt, you know. If, if I'm going to be three years before I present them, uh, then for sure, uh, ten days won't hurt. And so he said, I'll, I will do that uh, for ten days. And then in verse 13, it says, then... Let our countenance be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat the portion of the king's meat. He says, let's, let's uh, have a little contest here. Let all of us stand in line. <laughs> look at all of us. Look at our jaws, and look at our faces, and look at our arms, look at our chests, look at our legs. Uh, yeah, have a contest here. He says, just 10 days of it. You know, that won't get your neck, that won't get your head cut off. So it's just 10 days. And then look upon us, and at the same time, look upon those that have eaten the king's meat and had the king's wine, if you can get them sober. And, and, and then as thou seest, deal with thy servants. He still called himself a servant. You know, great men will often bow themselves. You know, great men are beautiful people. 
Great men will very often humble themselves. Here he was much greater than the man that was to train him, of course. The man that was to train him was a servant, and he was a prince, and yet he called himself a servant to this man. And, and he, he brought himself a lot of favor, and you better believe it. He brought himself a lot of love uh, from this person and a lot of understanding. And verse 14 says, So he consented to them in this matter and, and, and proved them for ten days. Now, ten days wasn't a long time to get your body in shape, but I guess uh, ten days at the king's table would uh, put a few pounds on you, you know, and ten days with the king's drink might teach you that alcohol is, a, is a something else. And so uh, he said, just ten days, and they were all called before him. Verse 15, and that, this is still in chapter 1. At the end of ten days, uh, their countenance appeared fairer, isn't that amazing, and fatter, <laughs> Oh, isn't that great? You know, the children of Israel for 40 years ate the manna. Ate the manna. That's all they had. They didn't have all of the different kinds of food like other people had. And the Bible says there wasn't one of them weak and there wasn't one of them sick. Did you know health comes from the Lord? Did you know that health is a thing that is related to faith? You see, it's not altogether what you put inside of you. It, it is in a great extent. But added to that, can be added something different and something greater. Uh, here, here was, well, well, well look, at, uh, look at Elijah. He ate one meal and went on it for 40 days. Well, one meal won't last anybody 40 days unless God's power is on it, unless God's anointing is on it, unless God is doing something with it, you see. And, and so God can do extra things for your body and for certainly for your soul and for your spirit. Let us all understand that and let us see. At the end of the 10 days, these four Hebrew children. Their countenances appeared fairer, no blemishes, and fatter in flesh. It's in your Bible too. That's verse 15. Then all the children, that's these guys that came from all, they were all princes from different countries where he had, where he had destroyed the empires and set himself up as the Lord of the world, uh, that uh, all these other princes, that they were fairer and fatter than them all living on bread and water. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? And verse 16, Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them the pulse, gave them the common bread that they might, that they might just eat the bread and, and that they might know that, uh, that, they, that they were set aside very particular, very special unto the Most High God. And if they would just put their full absolutely trust in the Lord, they would find it uh, to be better. In this first chapter of the book of Daniel, in this opening chapter, that's going to bring to us exciting and thrilling and amazing revelation. <laughs> he described empires unborn. He gave their nature two ways. Uh, he showed their part in what man would consider them, the golden head of a great person, you know. And, and the silver arms and breast mean the Medes and the Persians of their empire and the golden head of them. And then the brass. Notice the deterioration of the metallic man. Babylon was the greatest empire ever in the history of man. The Persians were second. And the, and, and, and the Greeks were the third, mighty, mighty, strong as the metal, you see. And, and there they were, the bronze around the middle. And then it came into the next empire, which was the empire of Rome. Described it, iron, iron, strong. And in the leg part, long, longest empire in the history of the world. And then it went on down, and we're still living in the Roman Empire. We're living in the fragments of the Roman Empire right today. Many, many, well, on the back of your dime, if you just have a look at it, you see the Roman emblem of the empire right on it, right there, right today, you see. And uh, as we look throughout our world, we're, we're still in the throes of a Roman Empire and, and the, that all of the laws that passed and, and, and so forth. And in the bottom of that great image, it says it was made of iron and of clay 
We're going to get into that. We're, go, we're, going, we're going to study that. But the thing I want you to know is that here was a boy with all the disadvantages. You see? <laughs> Did you know that God can take your disadvantages and turn them into advantages? That God can do that. He did it with this young man. Here he was in peril of, of being killed, in, invading armies, marching, screaming, yellowing, cursing, blaspheming, with a sword, killing women, children, men. And he was saved. A very undignified way of leaving town. No doubt around his neck there was a chain. Across between his hands there was a chain. And no doubt he drugged them with his feet with a chain about three foot there that had just room for a step with a chain. So he didn't leave there like a prince. It was like a slave. But this Nebuchadnezzar, really one of the cleverest imp emperors in history, said, I want the brains of the world here. And from all the nations of the world that he had conquered, he said, give me their princes. A and he tells us what all these young men had, had, had to be, you know. Look, look, look at it again. He says, they must be of the king's seed. You know, he didn't want to take anything in less than that. Uh, they must be princes. You see, he, he only accepted the top. They must be no blemish, no cripples, no shriveled arms, no blind eyes, no blemish. They must be well favored. When you look upon them and say, hey, I'd like to have him for a friend. You know, there are people that are just so charming and say, hey, I'd like to know you better, isn't it? And so they must be well favored. They must be skillful in all wisdom, you know, to have wisdom and to be skillful are two different things. And they must be skillful. Now, now these are the things that Daniel was and his friends. And so they, they did have some natural abilities, yes. But those natural abilities were given them of God. Every beautiful thing about you is a gift of God. Hey, you didn't work for it. God gave it to you. The hair on your head, the beauty of your face, God gave you that. These men had to be skillful in all wisdom, so they checked them out to see if they were clever. You know, cleverness is cleverness. And, and you can check a boy out, you, whether he's Chinese or Japanese or, or British, you know, you can check him out to see if he's clever or not. Don't take you long to find out. Skillful in wisdom, cunning in knowledge. Some people have knowledge that's as dead as a doorknob. These people were cunning in knowledge. That they all not only knew the fact, they knew how to apply it to situations. You see, so many people have facts, they don't know what to do with them. They know something, they don't know what to do with their knowledge. These men were cunning in knowledge. And it says they had an understanding of science. Everything that was known in those days of the stars and, and of how to make a, a wagon wheel or, or, or how, how to do something better, these men were there. Now that's the reason they had the hanging gardens. That's the reason the most beautiful gardens ever in the history of the world but were by the, the river Euphrates. <laughs> right down flat in the sand bed, they built mountains with the most gorgeous trees you've ever seen. Glorious were they. Yeah, they had the brains of the world, no wonder they could do it. Maybe no man's ever been as clever as he was to get people to help him to do what he wanted. They had an understanding of science. Ability to stand in the presence of the king's palace. Now, and, you know, ability to stand before great people, most, most of us don't have that. Uh, no, uh, we get before a great person and our tongue gets tied and we can't say anything. But they had to have ability to stand before a king and to talk intelligently and persuasively. And to whom they might teach the learning of the, of the tongue of the Chaldees. And so they had to have the ability, they had to have the ability to learn a language. You know, some people say, well, I know a lot of things, but I don't, I'm not good on languages. That would have counted them out. So these six or seven qualifications is what made something about Daniel as great as it was. And then the true greatness came when he says, now, wait a minute. Uh, thank you for choosing me. Uh, I, I see the table laden with, 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 with roasted pigs and, and all kinds of animals and, and all kinds of delicate cooking from the kitchen. I don't want any of that. I just don't want any of that. That's the lust of the flesh, you see. He says, all I want is, is, is a, a piece of bread with some water. And he said, I, I can look better than anybody here on it. Did you know the simple life is still the best life? And the simple life is still the greatest life there is. So in chapter 1 of Daniel, we get acquainted with the man. And then when we move into chapter 2, we move into some true greatness and majesty of what God can do through revelation. 
in a man. It's going to be really, really exciting. So I know you're going to stay with us real tight, and, and we're going to appreciate it. But in, in this first chapter, you come to know how he got there, who he is, the kind of nature he says it has within him, and how he could reach out to others. He had the capacity of reaching out, persuading others, helping others, blessing others, and having others to look upon him and to appreciate him. So this is an, uh, our introduction to this great and noble person I call a Daniel. And he was a man who understood and knew God in a very, very remarkable way. He outlived the empire of Babylon and went on to live in the empire of Persia, retaining his position as prime minister. Brother, when you can do that, you're something else. When you can go through a war and your side lose, and you come out on the other side, and you're still the prime minister of a new empire, you got something that others don't have. That makes this man one of the greatest men in all of history. And it makes him a man to be thought about and contemplated. And he causes you and me to want to rise up and be great and strong in the Lord God Almighty. May I bless you. Now, Father, we say thank you for such men. You're the same God as Daniel had. You haven't changed any. What you did do, you do right now. And so we plant our faith and our trust in you. And we ask you to qualify us. If we're not qualified yet, qualify us to be great in your kingdom. Let the spirit of the mighty God rest upon each one in the class. And those who hear us from this class throughout the world, bless them too. And help all of us to know that the God who did things is doing them now. That he can raise up men and women at this moment to be great in our world that we live. So bless each one. Strengthen each one. And let the faith of God flow through each one. And for your blessings, we so deeply thank you. And we love you for it. We say thank you. And God bless you. It's a great joy, a great pleasure to have you to be under the teaching of the Almighty. And may it transform and change your life. And plant faith deep within your hearts. And let me assure you that we here at the Lesser Summerall Evangelistic Association, where this beautiful message comes from, that we're standing with you in prayer for God to bless you and to strengthen you and to keep you. And that the God of Daniel will be your God, your Lord, and your Savior. He's reaching out to you in a very magnificent way. Receive him completely and absolutely. And let your life be changed and transformed by His mighty power. Will you do that? We want you to. Thank you so much for being with us. It's a great joy to see you. Today's lesson on Daniel has been recorded on audio cassette and is available for a donation of $5 or more. To order, write Lassie, Post Office Box 12, South Bend, Indiana, 46624. Please mention this program number on the screen when ordering. You may also use this address to obtain a catalog of all of Dr. Sumrall's books and tapes. This program has been made possible by private donations to LaCie. This has been a LaCie Broadcasting Network production.